Hello everyone, this is Professor Ryan Paul, and in this video I'm going to be talking about uh, Act 1 of Andrew Gibson's play, A Dollhouse, going into the plot and talking a little bit about the patterns of events and images and motifs that come up in this first act of the play. So one thing, first just to break down the act and think about what's happening, um, there are a few other events in between, but the primary events, it's really a series of conversations. First between Nora and uh, Torvald Helmer, her husband, then between Nora and Mrs. Linda, her friend from school, then between Nora and Krogstad, her husband's uh, subordinate, and as we find out, the man who has lent her uh, money secretly without her husband's knowing, and then finally with Nora and Helmer once again. So it's a series of conversations beginning and ending with the same person, um, and so we can look at this as a journey or as a series of developments, uh, scenes in which we see Nora's character and her situation develop and unfold. So some questions that we wanna ask just to, to get started. First, what is Nora's journey? What happens to her in this act? Where does she begin and where does she end, so to speak? Uh, same physical place, of course, but as a character in her life, how does her story begin and end in this first act? What are the relationships that we see between Nora and each character? And do we see any changes or developments starting to happen in those relationships? As the audience, what do we learn from each interaction about Nora, uh, about her life, about the characters, uh, and about what perhaps is going to happen later in the play? And what motifs, that is what uh, recurrent images or ideas or themes, uh, what topics come up between the conversations? That is, in these four conversations, what ties them together? What gives them continuity as a as a work of art, as a narrative? And then finally, how is the situation transformed by the end of Act One? Not just for Nora, but for all of the characters. What is different about this world that we're in? So we can begin by looking just at the first scene, even before the conversation with Helmer. And Nora arrives home, and there's sort of three uh, things I want to point out. One is the Christmas tree that she's brought home. So it gives us a sense of the setting and time, right? Christmas time. And the generous tip that she gives to the delivery man. And finally, the sweets, the macaroons that she secretly eats here. And these three very minor moments, very minor elements in the in the opening scene, really I think have a lot of significance because they set the tone for a lot of what's to come in Act One and really the, the play as a whole. And that is they introduce these topics of secrets, money, and disobedience, what we might call disobedience. Um, the the Christmas tree is being hidden from the children, right? It's it's there's a game they have to it's it's hidden until Christmas Day. So keeping secrets, even though this is a minor and, and perhaps a, a positive secret, a pleasant secret, but still the idea of keeping secrets. Money. We see that Nora is uh, rather generous and perhaps as we'll find out, frivolous with money. She gives the um, uh, the delivery man a, a basically a hundred percent tip. And then disobedience, that is, um, she's, it's another secret, the macaroons, we find out later that Torvald doesn't like her eating macaroons. Of course, perhaps it's a little ridiculous to uh, assert that a, that a wife needs to obey what her husband says about eating sweets, but we learn that, that in terms of their marriage, that's what's going on. She's not supposed to eat sweets, but she's disobeying him, and it's another one of her little secrets, one of her little pleasures that she keeps from him. So in Nora, in their first conversation between Nora and Helmer, when he uh, walks out of his study, um, some questions ask, what are the motifs from that opening scene that continue into the first conversation? Really, how do these issues of money, secrets, and disobedience, or issues of power and authority, how do they uh, uh, appear? How do they manifest in this scene and what is, or excuse me, in this conversation, and um, how does it uh, uh, help us to understand the characters' relationships and, and their inner psychology? Um, also, what actions or images seem more charged or significant after this first conversation? The eating of the macaroons is something that uh, we see her do it at the beginning of the play, but it's not until a little bit later that we learn that she's not supposed to be eating macaroons. So after this conversation, and this is something to ask yourself uh, every every after every development in a story, what from before has transformed? What do I see differently 
how do I see some of the events that have already happened differently now that this new information, this new event has occurred? What, uh, what do I see that didn't seem important before, but now seems really important? And some performance questions. These are questions that uh, to consider if you're both uh, as a performer or if you're thinking about how this might be acted on stage and if you're watching a performance. Because, of course, the lines are one thing, but how they are said, how they're delivered, how the characters act and react to each other, that's all going to be determined in performance by the actors themselves. So how does Nora behave when she's alone at the beginning? Does she behave differently? when Helmer enters, and how does her behavior change? How does she react to him, especially to his criticisms? How does she get what she wants from him, and what is it that she wants from her husband? These are just a few of the questions we could ask. You could get much more specific in terms of how she moves about the space, how she uh, behaves, how she uses props, how she acts when he gets upset, how she behaves towards his offer of money, all these sorts of things. So thinking about how is this actually happening? Again, we have the lines when we're reading it, but we need to imagine it actually being performed on stage, actually happening before us. Some similar questions about Torvald. How does he react when Nora comes home, what emotions does he display? Does he seem happy that his wife is home? Does he care? How does he react when he learns that she's been spending money? Is he upset about this or is he only pretending to be upset? Different versions will have Torvald sometimes being legitimately upset, sometimes just pretending to be upset or playing it up a little bit. How does he react when she asks for more money? How does he behave when she sulks? And how serious is he when he chastises her about spending or eating sweets? Is he angry? Is he legitimately mad? Does Nora get legitimately frightened of him? Or is it playful? All these things, again, not only do they tell us about the characters, but they also uh, help us to understand the story as a whole. If we imagine these two to be getting along really, really well at the beginning, then the ending is going to seem much more perhaps tragic. Uh, if we imagine them at the beginning as already having a, a, a painful and not a happy marriage, then the ending will not seem so tragic and perhaps seem even a little hopeful. After her conversation with Helmer, Nora has her first conversation with Mrs. Linda, her friend from uh, from childhood, from school. So how does the uh, her conversation with Helmer lead into her conversation with Mrs. Linda? That is, one, just in terms of uh, her mood and what she was talking about and how that influences what she says to Mrs. Linda, but more figuratively, metaphorically speaking, um, how is this a sort of uh, show us a different side of Nora, a different aspect of her character, a different uh, part of her world? And how do her interactions with Mrs. Linda differ, differ from what she had uh, said and how she interacted with Torvald. So comparing the two scenes, again, both literally in terms of the things they talk about, the power dynamics and, and those sorts of things, but as stages in Nora's journey, how are they, how are, uh, uh, what, what are the different stages that she's at as she transforms and moves through this play? Some of the key things that come up in Nora and Mrs. Lind's conversation, the passage of time and uh, how it does or doesn't change one. Um, Nora says that Mrs. Linda has changed radically. Uh, Mrs. Linda says Nora hasn't changed at all since she was a, a kid. Um, and that gets into the issue of Nora's childishness versus Mrs. Linda's maturity. Nora appears very childish and, and Christine Linda comments on it and says you're, you're still the way you were, just a, a silly little girl, essentially. Mrs. Linda, on the other hand, has had a much harder life uh, in many ways. And so she has a certain toughness, a certain maturity that Nora doesn't seem to have. And this connects to their marriages. Nora is in a happy, at least what's, what seems to be a happy marriage, whereas we learn Christine Linda had an unhappy marriage. She was in a marriage of convenience, essentially. Um, and the theme of self-sacrifice. Here's something that where the two characters perhaps are closer than, than they appear in the other factors. Uh, Mrs. Linda had sacrificed herself for her mother and her brother. She'd married a man she didn't love in order to support them. Similarly, Nora has sacrificed uh, herself by uh, uh, taking out the loan 
to save Torvald and thus, you know, not being able to spend any money on herself, having to scrimp and save in order to pay back that loan. So they both have engaged in certain self-sacrifice. Um, and in fact, that's something that they've both valued. Nora is is very happy about her, uh, the fact that she was able to save Torvald by taking out this loan. And Mrs. Linda, now that she no longer has anyone to care for, feels tremendously empty and she wants someone to take care of. So self-sacrifice, while perhaps all these other issues might be something in which, uh, at least on the surface, that seem to divide the characters, self-sacrifice is something that seems to um, uh, bring Nora and Mrs. Linda together. It's something they have in common. So some questions to ask in this scene, because this is the scene where we learn Nora's first secret, that she's taken about taken out the loan to uh, uh, to save Torvald. So what is her attitude about her secret? How does she feel about it? How does she talk about it to Mrs. Linda? What does having this secret mean to her? And how does Mrs. Linda react? What are her questions? What does she think about Nora? What are her worries? And as we've been watching the play and seeing Nora develop, does this change uh, how we think about her character or her marriage? I think it has to. She seems quite frivolous and, and even money hungry in the opening scene with Torvald, but now we learn that there's something else going on. She's not just about spending money for no reason. She actually does have, she may not be good with money. She may not understand finance, but she, is, has, she does have a, a, a something more going on than we had thought. So how does this change what, what we think about what's going on in her marriage and, and her as a character? The third conversation is Nora and Krogstad. So again, questions to ask what's happening when Krogstad first enters to speak with Nora. That is, what is she doing? What's going on? And how does what does this suggest metaphorically about his role in the story? It's a very uh, uh, significant moment. It's a great moment in terms of its description and 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 what's going on. And so it, it tells us something about these characters' relationship to each other. And again, how does the dynamic of this conversation compare to the one with Mrs. Linda? What issues or what ideas that have been getting developed through uh, each each interaction? How do they recur once more? in this conversation. We learn more secrets now. Uh, in addition to the secret that Nora took out alone, now we learn that Krogstad was the lender. And even on top of that, we learn that she forged her father's signature to, to take out this loan. Um, so learning more secrets once more, secrets that have been uh, something, again, that's something that's been, been an issue since the very beginning of the play. So what is Nora's justifica justification for her actions? She says, yes, I took out the loan. Yes, I forged my father's signature, but she tries to justify it. And what are her justifications and what does that tell us about her character, what she values, what she doesn't value, what she thinks is important, what she understands or doesn't understand about the world? And how does she react to, to Krogstad's threats of blackmail? Finally, we get back to the last uh, scene or the last conversation. Nora and Helmer once more. Uh, so now we can ask ourselves, what, how has her situation changed from the opening? Well, we know a lot more about her and also her situation, which it seemed so happy at the beginning is now much more precarious. Uh, again, what motifs from the previous conversations recur in this one? Um, and how have they, how do we see them differently? They were talking about money in the first uh, conversation. They're talking about money here at the end of the act. But how is that conversation different? What What is different about it, especially from our perspective as the audience, given what we know? And also given what we know and given what Nora now knows, um, how does she react to Nora's word, to, to, excuse me, to Helmer's words? How does she react when he talks about Krogstad and Krogstad's potential negative influence on his children? Um, how is it that what Nora has learned now has transformed her understanding of the world around her and her position in that world.
Okay, now let's look at some patterns and parallels, just some interesting parallels in terms of the way the characters relate to each other that I think um, can uh, uh, give us uh, some good questions and ideas for investigation and further analysis. First, if we think about the relationship between Krogstad, Nora, and Helmer, there's a, there's a circularity there that is quite interesting. Krogstad loans money to Nora, and she uses that money to save Helmer. And then now in the present, Helmer gives money to Nora, which she gives, which she uses to pay back Krogstad. So we have the circularity. And um, of course, Helmer doesn't know that his money is going to Krogstad. So there's this uh, whole aspect of this, this, circ this pattern that's unknown. But it, it tells us something about Nora's relationship. And, and it's interesting that as a woman, she is between these two men, right? She has to, uh, and, and in fact, has to pretend to be a man that is forge her father's signature in order to participate in this circulation of money. That's the only way she can get in, uh, have any access to money is being given it by her husband or loaning it, getting it loaned from Krogstad under false pretenses. Another interesting parallel is that both Krogstad and Mrs. Linda are in a sort of similar situation or similar relationship to Nora. Both of them are trying to get her to help them keep their job, or rather Krogstad is trying to blackmail Nora to help him keep his job uh, while Mrs. Linda asks for help because she is in an unfortunate situation. So they both need Nora's help uh, with Helmer and they ask her for to intervene with Helmer. Krogstad, however, is doing it through blackmail. Mrs. Linda is doing it through uh, perhaps a sense of trying to get Nora to pity her, showing that she needs help, right? So, but again, Nora is the, the uh, gateway to Helmer. Um, and uh, what's even more interesting is that I think we see that Helmer agrees to give Mrs. Linda a job, but he refuses Nora's request to help Krogstad. And that's going to be another issue, as we'll see in the play, that turns out to be uh, a complication for Nora. Perhaps a minor one, but this will, will become a little bit more significant in Acts 2 and 3. But the study, Helmer's study, which we, at least uh, in the stage version, we never see. It's just doors that go to a space that we don't get access to as the audience. In a film version, of course, they can show it. But in Act 1, there's only two characters that we see who get direct access to the study. And that's Dr. Rank and Krogstad. And Dr. Rank is Helmer's friend although we'll, that'll be complicated a little bit in Act 2, whereas Krogstad is Helmer's rival or subordinate, uh, although he is a former friend. They've known each other for a while. So these two people with different, um, different relationships to Helmer, one friendly, one antagonistic, antagonistic, they are the only two who get direct access to Helmer's study because they are also the men in the play. It's a male space that only men get access to. and some parallels between the characters that I think are striking. Uh, Nora and Mrs. Linda. Nora's a wife, Mrs. Linda's a widow. Nora is rather naive, or at least that's what we, we, how she's presented. Whereas Mrs. Linda seems much more worldly. She knows a lot more about how things work. Nora's in what appears to be a loving marriage, while Mrs. Linda is in a, was in a loveless marriage. Uh, Nora is wealthy, or at least her, her husband is going to be getting more money. They're going to be doing quite well, whereas Mrs. Linda has been financially struggling and she needs work. And finally, uh, in, a, in the most striking kind of opposition, Nora forges her father's signature to save her husband, whereas Mrs. Linda had married a husband that she didn't love to support her mother and brothers. So uh, just to looking at these different aspects of the characters to see how they uh, relate to each other, how they differ from each other. And this helps us to understand their interactions by thinking about their backgrounds, where they come from, what they want, what they've been through. Another comparison, Torvald and Krogstad. They're both lawyers, but Torvald is of a higher status. He's a more important lawyer, has a, a higher rank, or act, you know, whereas Krogstad's sort of a minor uh, officiant. And Torvald's also, of course, now becoming a, a bank manager. Uh, and so Torvald is very successful. He has a good reputation. He, he has a reputation as a stand-up guy, so to speak. Um, he's well-respected. Krogstad, on the other hand, is not so successful. And he has a bad reputation because of his actions. Um, 
Torvald gives money to Nora. Of course, he also receives money from Nora or has received money from Nora. He doesn't know that, her secret about the loan. Krogstad uh, has also given money to Nora and is now getting money from Nora as her creditor, her lender. And he, of course, knows Torvald's secret or Nora's secret. So um, ironic that Krogstad, who is Nora's antagonist, knows more about her than her own husband does to some extent. And of course, Krogstad bl blackmails Nora to help him, whereas Torvald refuses her request to help Krogstad. But he does help Mrs. Linda because she's a woman and he wants to take charge. And parallel between Krogstad and Nora. Um, Krogstad uh, had corrupt parents, or at least that's what Torvald claims. That's what made him into the person that he is. And we learned that Nora's father was corrupt, or at least there were plenty of suspicions about him. He was bad with money, and there were a lot of rumors and accusations. They both committed forgery. They both committed forgery, although Krogstad did it for, uh, Nora claims to have done it for a good reason. Right? She feels she did for a good reason, helping her husband. Krogstad committed forgery, not for a good reason, or at least we don't know. And Krogstad has a corrupting influence on his children, again, according to Torvald. And when Nora hears this, this is something that, that triggers her. She fears, is she going to have a corrupting influence on her children because of her secrets and crimes? Some final questions to think about now that we've looked through uh, Act 1 a little bit more. First, what is, again, to return to the question in the beginning, what is Nora's journey in Act 1? How would we characterize her journey? How would we describe where she is at the beginning, what happens to her, and where she is at the end of Act 1? Is she in a higher status? Is she in a lower status? Uh, better off, worse off, and why? And what conflicts are set up for Act 2? What what issues are going to come out uh, that we might expect based on the action, the language, the imagery that's, hap that's been uh, prevalent in Act 1? What further conflicts, how are these going to develop in the next act? What characters have appeared but haven't yet interacted extensively with Nora? Two main ones, of course, are Dr. Rank and Anne-Marie, and those will be two figures that she interacts with uh, in significant ways in Act 2. And what questions do we have about the characters or the relationships? What do we still not know about them in terms of why they do what they do, what they want, and what do we think might happen between their relationships? There's a mystery about something going on between Krogstad and Mrs. Linda. They seem to know who each other, uh, know each other's identities. So that's another potential relationship or, or interaction that we're not quite sure about, that we might ask about and expect to be developed further on. And finally, what other patterns of behavior, imagery, character, et cetera, have emerged in this act? I've, I've really only talked about a very few elements. Uh, so what other things can we see, can we uh, recurring, being uh, defining what happens in this act? So that's the end of this video, but it will be continued uh, taught when I talk about uh, act two and then ultimately act three. Uh, if you have any questions, there's my email. You know how to get in touch with me. Um, of course, you can also leave a comment on the video. Uh, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video or in class, and have a great rest of your day.